the whole point is to humiliate the person you're talking to in one way or another, either intellectually or morally. And this is the reason that wisdom in the United States is negatively correlated with intelligence. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And to understand that properly, you have to know what the word fool means in Proverbs. It does not mean a stupid person. The, the, the word that gets translated fool means someone who is openly and shamelessly immoral. This proverb is essentially the equivalent of Jesus saying, do you see the Pharisees? There's more hope for a prostitute than for them. So, now we get to the next thing, which is the functional intelligence level. So we're about to have biology. Um, people in solution mode, like solution mode doesn't make you smarter. Uh, if you're not very smart, then you don't get smarter in solution mode. But it does let you use all of the intelligence that God gave you. People in blame mode are, have an artificially lowered intelligence level. Basically, people in blame mode are temporarily stupid, and that has to do with amygdala hijacking. And I mean this quite literally. They are literally temporarily stupid. So have any of you heard the phrase amygdala hijacking? No. So I have translated, with the help of a dictionary, obviously, uh, I have translated the biological terms in this slide into Chinese, if that's helpful. So, a man of quick temper acts foolishly. What? So, when our subconscious decides that we are threatened, the, am the amygdala is a part of the brain that's right, right at the base, right, right above the brainstem. It is the most primitive part of our brain. And it floods our brain with adrenaline and norepinephrine. <laughs> I'm a classics major, not a, a pre major. This has a whole lot of effects. It, it, it uh, stimulates our muscles so that we're temporarily, you know, can run faster and hit harder. Um, but one of the effects of these chemicals in our brain is it shuts down the prefrontal cortex which is the part that's smart. It is literally, biologically true that when the amygdala kicks us into either anger or fear, when it kicks us into survival mode, we drop 10 to 15 points in IQ. <laughs> that's, that, I'm not making that up. That's literally true. It's the equivalent of losing 10. You lose functionality in your prefrontal cortex you are literally stupid. Okay? So if you're in a mode that's dominated by anger or fear, right, even if you're calm, most of the other people aren't. What you have in your blame mode is a lot of stupid people hurting each other. So if we do, later on, if we do something on controlling anger, uh, which I told you guys last week, I have a really terrible temper. So my parents had to invest a lot of time in training me to control the temper. Um, two things you have to do the moment you realize you're getting angry. Anyone know what the first thing you have to do when you get angry is? Stop and leave. Nothing. Do nothing. <laughs> do nothing. Because whatever it is that you're about to do is stupid. <laughs> Okay? Really and truly, the best thing you can do to train yourself how to react when you, when you get enraged is to just not do anything. I or say it. anything. Or don't do anything, don't say anything. I look at the ground, because if I'm looking at the person, then I will make a face at me and I'm not going to lose it. When, when, I was a, when I was a kid, there was a standard thing that American kids were taught, which is when you're angry, count to ten before you say anything. Right? Not Don't do anything. <laughs> Whatever it is you feel like doing is something you're going to regret. Because angry people are stupid. You have to tell yourself, right now, I am stupid. So, um, 
And then the second thing, actually, anger, there are lots of spiritual things that you do to try to take care of anger in the long term, but anger is fundamentally a physical state of your brain. And so the second thing is to get yourself back cycled back down, and there are various physical techniques for it. But as long as, as, long as your brain is turned off, you're not functional. So you need to not do anything until you're cycled back down. Because whatever you're going to do is stupid, right? So the important thing for right now is if you're in blame mode, you're probably in stupid mode. <laughs> Literally, biologically, your brain's not working right. Okay? This next thing, solution mode people and, and blame mode people, they look at someone who has a problem and they tend to see them very, very differently. And this goes back to if, if I... If I have a problem and you point out to me that 100% of the problem is being caused by my behavior, is that good news or bad news? Depends on what mode you're in. Depends on what mode you're in. So if I'm in solution mode, it's good enough why? It's why is it good news? Because I can solve it. Problems that involve making other people change, <laughs> making other people change. That's, that's an answer. That's, if, if, if the solution to your problem is other people have to change, that's really bad news. Right? So if I'm looking for a solution and you are able to point out to me that it's 100% my behavior, that's awesome. I can fix it. If I'm in blame mode, really bad news because that means it's totally my fault. Right? So, solution-oriented people tend to be, especially the ones who have experience and have figured out what actually works in solving problems, they tend to focus on the person with the problem as, what can that person do to get the problem solved? Because get somebody else to change is the worst answer. Right? People who are in blame mode, unless they are mad at themselves, in which case they are attacking themselves, people who are in blame mode habitually think of the person who has the problem as a victim, as the, the person that bad things are happening to. Okay? This makes it really difficult for solution mode people and blame mode people to talk to each other, because the blame mode people hear something very different from what the solution mode people are saying, right? Um, if you're in a political context and you have, and you have on the one side you have a conservative, and and the, and the point of discussion is. Uh, how do we solve the high levels of crime in the black community? So, on the one side you have a conservative, and the conservative starts listing the things that, the, that people in the black community could do to solve the problem without getting white people to change. Okay? He's thinking over here, the blame mode person on the other side will in all sincerity believe that the conservative is a racist because he is blaming black people for their own problems. He is saying it's black people's fault. If, however, the conservative, if he hears someone on the other side start talking as though the only solution for black, black conservatives in particular get really furious about this. There's not very many of those, but the ones that are there tend to get really angry about this. If he see or hears someone talking about how the only way, that the only people who can solve the problems of the black community is white people have to be less racist. This tends to really enrage black conservatives because the overwhelming majority of black conservatives are solution-oriented people and they take it as an insult for you to be saying that black people are so impotent and incompetent that they can't solve their own problems and they need other people to solve the problem for them. And 
black conservatives tend to think that liberals are terribly racist. So there's a phrase that there's a phrase that black conservatives use, which is the bigotry of low expectations. The idea that you just can't expect black people to be able to solve their own problems. Now, the truth is that the liberals are not trying to insult black people by saying they can't solve their problems, and the conservatives are not trying to insult black people by saying that black people, that is, the problems are their own fault. Right? But each side is going to perceive the other side's view as being insulting to black people. And each side is going to accuse the other of having a bad opinion about blacks. And each side is going to sincerely believe that the people on the other side are racist. Do you see how that works? Right? The solution-oriented people, it's all about, can I get my problem solved? And someone who can't solve his own problems comes off as weak and ineffective. Yes? Can you give us some example, like, closer to us, related to the real life? So, so, well, I, just, I want to be careful to make sure I don't accidentally step on something that's really happening. Um, because I don't want to hurt people's feelings, is the, is the biggest thing. They're accidentally getting into something that's real to someone. But, um, because we know you are in this situation, we will not get Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, can, I, can I just uh, um, give a real example of that, uh, which happened just like the one or half an hour or so. <laughs> so you, you, can, you can analyze that and just see the suggestion. You know, just a uh, few minutes before we came over here, you know, Harry uh, cooked something uh, uh, for uh, for the dinner, and then uh, uh, because I know the uh, the host, uh, they are kind of busy, so we were uh, making some easy uh, uh, snack food style things, you know, uh, like uh, I was making a salad, and uh, Xin Shen was uh, boiling some tender soybean uh, for snack, and uh, so since I was busy doing my part, you know, and I saw that. Uh, 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 in her pot, you know, with too much water and with a lot of a frozen soybean. So, I, since I was in a hurry, so I had no time to explain to her that the uh, heat capacity of water is a uh, relatively large value and uh, with so much water and the frozen stuff, you know, it takes a much longer time to cook and because we, we need to hurry up, you know, so uh, I just keep telling her to dump more water into the sink, you know, more and more, you know. And uh, so I think by that time, you know, she was kind of uh, irritated by my, uh, uh, you know, style. And, well, after a while, uh, she was, uh, uh, you know, cooking that pot on the stove. And uh, I tasted the, uh, you know, the, the liquid and uh, I uh, had some more salt and it's not tasty, you know. So. Uh, and then uh, she asked me to drain the uh, when it was ready because it's really quick, quick to cook. So uh, he, she asked me to, to drain the water, and I thought it was too quick to uh, you know for the salt to really dissipate and diffuse into the, the, the soybean. So it, there, there's no flavor. So I would prefer to uh, take the whole thing, just dump it into a glass bowl, and you know and take it over here and. She was so stubborn, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, I told her that it uh, was not enough time, you know, and so why don't we just take everything and she said, was so oh, no. drinking and like that, you know, so she just drained everything and then uh, started to pour like a soy sauce and, uh, uh, you know, um, set some more oil in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that, you know, uh, usually we have two different preferred styles. And one is uh, without oil and one is with oil. And I don't like the oily taste stuff, you know, make my finger oily after eating that. So I, you know, but at that moment I realized that, you know, uh, it's just like both styles will work, you know. So I just shut up, you know. So uh, and then, uh, uh, well, she just uh, poured the soy sauce and oil in there and just, uh, here we are. You know, so uh, I guess uh, people will eat the oily stuff later. <laughs> 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 Middle and you know, avoid the oil and the soy sauce and 
avoid any um, continuous uh, debate. I think this is more like a debate, you know, mm -hmm. which one is more rational, or logic, or scientific. But anyway. It's so, very interesting. I think I'm not interested in debating with anyone outside our family. <laughs> inside. Okay. Yeah, but inside our family, we constantly have debate. <laughs> <laughs> So you're always inside and you try to prove the other one is stupid. I do not know whether am I trying to... And from outside you know that all the time. Because you feel, feel safe to, to argue inside. Yeah. Yeah. You don't feel safe to argue outside the family. Because if you argue, you may lose a friend. But if you argue with your jumper, you are going to be... In your lecture, I was asking myself, I noticed that I seldom debate with any other people, right? <laughs> Try to prove you are smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that's my intention. I really doubt that's my intention. So because what's my intention? I have no intention to prove I'm she smarter than you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm confused myself. In the solution is just so you have to go your own way. <laughs> yeah, actually, maybe you can do that. People. You will be responsible for your stuff, and she will be responsible for her stuff. Yes. And that's the solution. Really you just stay. I generally feel like uh, I generally feel like if I have delegated to somebody the job, I have delegated to them the process. And if I want it to be done a certain way, I should do it myself. Yeah. Um, because different people work differently. Uh, but yeah, I cannot see him cooking. <laughs> I cooked dinner last night. <laughs> he cooked dinner last night. Watch. I cannot watch. Can't watch. Can't watch. Can't watch. Can't watch. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I misheard that. It was a different accusation. Than what was. Yeah. Um, yeah. We don't cook the same uh, the same style. Uh, all right. So Helen told me that she wanted me to use a lot more real life examples. But I will tell you quite frankly that I'm very leery of soliciting real life examples because. I am not a counselor, and I don't want to find myself involved in marital counseling with an audience. <laughs> so it's like, well, we can do real life examples as long as they're real life examples that nobody is really invested in. But, but um, when you talk about the solution mode, actually, I'm thinking about the real life mm -hmm. in, in our family because we don't, the politics is a far away. But way. for the real life, most of the things there's no solution. Or the, the need the, we don't need a solution. Right? Now actually a couple days ago I talked with my son because he learned the solution mode and the and the blame mode from you like a couple few months ago. But uh, I said to him respecting a family between wife and a husband. Sometimes the solution either way is fine. You know, most of the I would say ninety five percent of the is Either way is, is fine. So, but how do you try to solve it? You have a, you have a, well, because any solution is fine. Yeah. A, it's not, either way is fine. It's always a very nice way to end the conversation. Yeah. The way is saying that either way is fine. That yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah. that way you, should, you don't say this it. Is, either way is fine. <laughs> this is actually, this is actually, I hadn't, ever, I hadn't thought of this, but that's a really good. Thing to raise because there's an important clarifying point, and I will take this into account from now on the next day. In solution mode, the point is not to find the solution, it's to find a solution. As long as you both in the solution mode, then at least you don't blame, you are trying to compromise each other or figure out a way. So in my case, uh, with or without soy sauce, uh, the soy bean tastes good, right? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. matter. Yeah, so that's why I just shut up, you know. Can you use a, use a keyword, delegate? If you delegate, yeah, delegate. the work yeah. to someone, yeah, just let her do you it. need to trust him or her. Yeah. yeah. To do the job. How so about you don't before step in delegate? To, before deciding who is going to do this or make a decision. Again, there is a rubber. 
Uh, this, you go, don't blame me, okay? I will let you do it, okay? I will let you do it. I will completely trust you, but don't it stupidly. <laughs> That's the hidden line. Just don't yeah. do it stupidly. Don't do it not the way I like it. Uh, exactly. That's yeah. a hidden line. It means you do it, okay? Uh, 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 you, you talk to your wife. You say you do that. I will not say anything, okay? But you better do it the way. <laughs> you, you don't say it. You use your eyes. <laughs> you will do it, okay? It will be right. Then you all get it. You can, the thing is, you can delegate and you can tell someone this is how I want it done as, as long as you say that up front and if they say, well, you know, I can't work that way so I'm not going to do it, then you can do it yourself, right? But, which you can tell kids, I want you to do this and this is how I want it done. But the, the, the more you constrain how someone wants to do it, the more you constrain how they want to do it, the more danger you become in of having now given the wrong person the job, right? Um, if the job is cook dinner, then Helen can have me cook dinner as long as she doesn't expect it to be Chinese food. <laughs> but if she wants dinner to be Chinese food, then she can't delegate it to me because I can't do it. Right? I can't do it that way. If she just says, can you make dinner tonight? As long as I'm free to make spaghetti or potato mix soup or hamburgers, we're good. She says, can, can, you know, can you make fried rice? And the answer is, no, <laughs> I can't, actually. Um, so, so, Jack, I, I still don't understand. Okay, when, you, when you raise up this example, you yeah. just want us to say, hey, I understand the feeling. No, I mean, I, my <laughs> no, question is, that is a comfort I, I think he was mode. going back to debate rather than about this. Right? No, but that, how do I know that's uh, actually giving uh, a yeah. comfort, comfort mode or solution or what? <laughs> ah, my that would get to help over time. Uh, we have about 20 minutes. Let me, I tell you what, let me try to get through, let me try to get through We're the rest of this. We're still on this slide. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my question is whether uh, simply shut up uh, is the, the best choice in that scenario or have an even better choice? No, it's probably... Look, there are, when you talk about going back and forth in your family, there are, there are a lot of people who just enjoy you know, going back and forth. Not, not to make people look stupid, but just as a game. Um, just kind of as a sport. <laughs> I'm totally serious. Uh, and, and, uh, and one of the reasons I know that's true is because there were a lot of Italians where I grew up. They just go. Um, and um, and I had a Jewish friend once. I, I I wrote out a short story version of Jesus walking on the water and, and the events leading up to it. And and so she read it because she's also a historian, and I, I wanted her taking it. And she said, this is good, except your characters aren't Jewish. And I said, well, what do you mean by not Jewish? And she said, nobody's arguing. And then she told me, and she said, look, arguing is a national sport of Jews. And she told me a story. She was, she was a professor in Tel Aviv. So they enjoy it. Oh, yeah. She said she was riding on a bus, and a woman with her, like, 30-year-old son got on the bus. And they were arguing about something. And she said, everybody on the bus... Took sides. And she said, two stops later, the woman and her son got off the bus, and the argument just kept on going. <laughs> Try to make you angry, you keep on calling. <laughs> 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 
very well. well. You have if, the, if, the, if the message that your body language is giving is, you silly emotional person, you should be calm and We do need to learn to hear well, your behavior is the issue. We do need to learn to hear that as good news. And Proverbs actually pounds this over. There are probably 15 different verses in Proverbs that have to do with that. You know, Proverbs is mostly trying to train the son um, to learn to take correction as a favor. And and so I've told I've, I've told my kids there's, there's some checks, right? So. Two kinds of people in the world. There are, the, there are people who want to be wise, and there are the people who want to feel smart. How do you tell the difference? If you, the way you tell, if this is which kind of person I am. How do you feel when someone tells you you're wrong? Right? If if you're happy when someone says, "Hey, I want to tell you, I think you, I think you're wrong about this," and your answer is, "Really? Why?" Right? then you're someone who wants to be wise. If you're actually to get all offensive, then you're someone who wants to feel smart. Do you want to actually be a good person, or do you want to feel good about yourself? The way you can tell that is how do you feel when someone tells you that what you're doing is wrong? If your answer is, really? Fine. And you take it as a favor when someone corrects you and lets you know that what you're doing is wrong, then you are someone who actually wants to be a good person. If you get mad at them, you're someone who wants to feel good about yourself. Not many people are. Not many people are, because most of us are sinful. And that's why the Bible has to pound on saying you need to become someone who welcomes correction. And like I say, Proverbs over and over and over. I picked four of them. I could have picked ten. I could have picked ten. Right? Um, so we want to learn to think of ourselves as people for whom it is good news that the issue is something we can fix, which almost always means we're contributing to the problem. But what you have to do is you have to learn to hear. When someone says, your behavior is at the base of this, people who are in blame mode hear this as, you are part of the problem. What we need to do is we need to learn to hear that as you can be part of the solution. It's the same news. It's the same news. Whether you hear it as you're part of the problem and you act defensively, or whether you hear it as you can be part of the solution, it's a matter of whether we have trained ourselves to be in the solution mode. Um, Again, because blame mode is natural to our sinful selves, solution mode is not what is sadly true is that if you have, I think I said this last week, so it can be this fast, you got five people in a room, and two of them are in blame mode, and three are in solution mode, in 10 minutes, either everybody will be in blame mode. If there's anyone who's not in blame mode, it's be, it would be because they have stopped, and they just backed off and said, I'm shutting down. I'm not part of this, right? Um, because blame mode is contagious and solution mode is not. Um, and the reason, you know, that's Proverbs saying, you know, a quarrelsome man, here we go. The, the thing about kindling, I don't know how many of you have built fires. I grew up, we kept our house warm with a fireplace, not the central heat. Um, kindling's job is to catch all the other wood on fire. Right. Kindling is the stuff that if you can get the kindling on fire before long, all the rest of the wood will be on fire too. Right. People in blame mode assume everyone else is in blame mode too, and what they, because they're doing anger or fear, uh, let me skip past this, what they do is they attack. And when we are attacked, how do we naturally respond? We go, the amygdala kicks in, right? We go into either anger or fear. We go into that survival mode. When we're attacked, we naturally fight back. So 
One person in the room in blame mode can turn everybody else into blame mode. So, <laughs> now it's embarrassing that you've asked that question as though you don't know since I'm about to say, here's how we have one in our household. It's apparently going to be a surprise to Helen. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is a rule that we have. I had to institute it for myself in self-defense. And I am not saying that we are generally successful. Right? This is an aspirational rule. Only one guy gets to be mad at a time. So whoever gets mad first, it's their turn, it's not yours. Right. So you guys try to raise who is the first. <laughs> it, it seems unfair because if you have one person in the house who has a worse temper than other people, it's always their turn. Right. But the problem is not a whole lot of damage gets done by one mad person, but if two people get mad, bad things start happening. Right. So, me. Actually, Helen does a very good job of when she gets angry, she stops Hi. talking because she really doesn't like to hurt people. And that's, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, that's actually a really good rule. And it goes back to what I was saying, right? The most important thing to do when you're angry is nothing. Right? What this rule really means is that as soon as anybody realizes somebody's gotten mad, then whatever we're talking about no longer matters. What matters now is everybody else staying calm. So everybody else has to stop thinking about whatever we were talking about. We have to stop trying to get the problem. To, and the problem now is that we have an angry person. Okay? And the first step in the solution is everybody else has to stay calm. All right? So, you know, once the person calms down, we can go back to whatever we were talking about. And because the reason is blame mode is naturally contagious and one per two people mad is a whole lot worse, is a whole lot more than twice as bad as one person being angry. Because the dynamics between multiple angry people are where really bad problems happen. So I am not at all saying that if you come to our house you will never see two people angry at once. But this is this is just sort of your first line of defense. Now, we talked about this last week, uh, so I'm not going to go back over it, other than that primarily it's a matter of you've got to use your body language, your tone of voice, and your body language. That's what people react to most of They do not really react to what you say. If, if you punch one of their buttons, right, if, if, if there's an incident that everyone in the family knows, is a really sore point, and you bring that up, well, then your words will matter. But, but generally speaking, people are responding to body language, tone of voice. Um, this, is, um, this is why someone who's being very calm and everything else can get other people angry, and why are they so angry? Because, because it's not what you say. It's not what you say, it's what your body is saying. It's what your tone of voice is saying. Uh, and we are not, in our culture at least, we're not trained to be aware of this and to pay attention to it, to how we are projecting to each other. This is one of the things I have been working with Kai on. You're projecting things you don't want to project with your body. 